Um, so I am Ashish Jha, I'm the faculty director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, and I have the distinct pleasure and honor of being with Dr. John Nakengasong, who's the director of the Africa CDC. Um, thank you so much for being here over at HGHI and chatting with us about the Africa CDC, what it is, how it came about. Um, but before we get into that, um, do, you wanna, do you mind telling us a little bit about your own personal history, your uh, background, and then how you eventually came to really start and lead the Africa CDC. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, Dr. Nakengasong, if we could just begin with you and then we'll talk about uh, the Africa CDC after that. Okay. No, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to uh, visit your institute. I mean, I've heard a lot of um, the, the incredibly good work that the institute has done. I used to have uh, uh, some very good friends and colleagues here, Michael, uh, 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 Manik, yeah. and so the, um, I'm originally from Cameroon, and I left Cameroon at the age of uh, 23 and, mm. and did uh, my extensive studies at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in, in Belgium, in Antwerp, and mainly in HIV. So mm. I'm a basic virologist, so I know something about uh, viruses, okay. And, and uh, I joined the US CDC in 93, uh, 94, okay. and, and started the um, the few site in in uh, in uh, uh, and started the laboratory that supported the few site in in Ivory Coast. Mm. At that time, if you uh, those who have been in HIV for long will recall that there was a project CEDA, which uh, started off being the main project and a collaboration between the U.S. Uh, CDC and and Belgium and other partners to uh, understand HIV AIDS in Africa. Then there was an unrest in Kinshasa and the project got moved to um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And so I started my, uh, uh, my journey within the US CDC there, and subsequently moved to um, uh, the headquarters and when PEPFA was launched, and was the pioneer lab uh, chief to set up the whole laboratory program for PEPFA. Wow. And um, which, um, interestingly, over the years, it became um, uh, uh, as the Institute of Medicine would describe it as a signature achievement for PEPFA under uh, Ambassador Bex. Yeah. Then at some point I just said <coughs> to, uh, it, uh, I've risen up the ladder to, the, uh, to become the uh, Deputy Center Director, the acting for that center, uh, for Center for Global Health. And at some point I just said, um, when the opportunity showed up after the, eight, uh, the Ebola crisis in West Africa, the head of states of Africa said, it's time for us to have our own centers for disease control and prevention because yeah. we're shocked by the way uh, 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 the, the continent was uh, put on its knees, mm -hmm. where there were dead bodies on the streets of Liberia, uh, 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 Conakry, and uh, uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and set up uh, and accelerated the establishment of the CDC, Africa CDC, which was officially launched on the 31st of. January 2017. Mm. So just about three years ago. Just about three years ago. Another time, I, I just said, uh, 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 I look at that and I said, I'll, I'll put my, my heart in the ring because I think I can go to the continent and, and contribute. My position is a mandate position, which is, means it's semi-political. Mm. Uh, you selected by uh, the governing board made of ministers of health from, from Africa. You have a mandate for four years, renewable ones, and that, that is it. So, but I think that um, I, I was attracted to, to that for several reasons. One is that um, the, it offered a, a, a transformational moment for Africa to, to help uh, uh, the continent articulate its own needs mm. and, and wants. And, and for a continent that is a continent of the future, we should always remember that in the next 30 years, one in every four human beings on earth will be African. And, and that would change the dynamics of, yeah. of, of public health. I mean, the whole concept of public health is about <clears throat> the pathogen, the, the, the population, and the policies. So Africa, if we do not uh, articulate what we, we, we want to see for ourselves and take ownership of that, it becomes very complicated to use the old public health architectures that were designed in 1947 yeah. and that, are con that continue to guide public health practice today for, 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 for the continent. In other words, where there is absolutely no original idea that comes from Africa for public health, none. Uh, you, you told that, uh, you literally told that you have to do global health security agenda. 
and probably we don't know what that is um, in May. And then 40 countries are qualified for that. Yes, we will do that. And then the next elections happen in the West, and then uh, you are told we don't have money anymore to do that. that, that, that I mean, from 40 countries, we reduce it to 10 countries. Okay, yes, that is very good. We are told that you have to do health system strengthening. Okay, that is very good. We have to, to do that. What is it? And, and we are told that we are universal health coverage. We have to sing that song. Yes, we also agree that we'll sing the song of May. So it cannot be that way. So the Africa CDC, because of its unique location within the African Union Commission, which is the secretariat where all head of states of Africa come and discuss the, the future of Africa and have actually launched the so-called the Agenda 2063, which is the roadmap and blueprints for Africa's development, including her, which is the aspiration goal number one for that agenda, is very important. We believe that Africa CDC offers hope for the continent, it's a promise for the continent, and it has the convenient power at the level of the head of states. And there is a big difference between WHO and Africa CDC. Yeah. In other words, when the coronavirus uh, hit and we will uh, uh, we develop a strategy, a continental strategy. We convened the ministers of health within one week, and 42 of them were in Addis Ababa. From Nigeria, Morocco, Egypt, all of them, all of them were in them because of the political way that yeah. the organization has there. 42 of them, that was Saturday, on a Saturday, February 22nd. That is, it shows that the continent uh, is saying we need a structure that we see it, we believe in it, and we, we, we own it. I think that is very, very important. It's still a promise and, and, and hope for the continent, but the baby steps, if we do it right, it will truly be transformational in the way that uh, we, we do things there. Lastly, there is, we have to move. If in 20 years we're still doing what we are doing today, where there's an outbreak of Ebola in DRC and uh, partners fly in, wear their flag jackets with their logos and flags and help Congo to resolve that and then they move out, we fail. And then we fool ourselves and all everybody, both the donors and the Africans, you just fool yourself. I think that's where I think Africa CDC can truly play a, a, a significant role, a pivotal role, especially as the continent integrates. In talk, you probably are aware that the continent has, uh, uh, has now launched a free trade agreement. In the next, uh, the Secretariat will be in Accra, Ghana, this is an open free trading area of 1.2 billion people. People are moving. 1.2 billion people are moving on the continent. But the public health components, they have to be secured. Otherwise, the free trade agreement will not work. We we'll yeah. see what uh, coronavirus is doing. Gabon is saying, if you are from any country that we've heard that you have corona, you cannot come to our country there. So you, you disrupt the free trade agreement there. So those are some of the elements that yeah. promise, it gives you promise for the future for Africa. You know, you highlighted so many important issues, and I just want to pull out a couple. And, and then uh, one is um, you talked about Africa as a continent of the future, and it takes only going to Africa to realize what that means. It is incredibly dynamic, the change that is happening among the young people and the hope for what the future brings. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that I used to see in India in the 90s. Um, it, a hopefulness for the next 20 years is our 20 years. It's not, so I think in that context, it is really striking to think about how so much of the health agenda has been set in Geneva and Washington and London, and we have asked African partners to respond and react to that. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hear you saying is that the Africa CDC is one manifestation of a new world where Africa sets its own agenda and articulates its own priorities in a way that's different than the past. Is that, is that, Absolutely. Is that a critical very, part of this? Very, very well captured. That's why my talk yesterday was uh, a new public health order yeah. for the continent, which yeah. I believe in strongly. Yeah. And articulated the five pillars of what a new public health order should look like for yeah. the continent. Yeah. One is exactly what I mean, you mentioned. It, it is the ability, first of all, and we, we, let me just step back and see. Yeah. We have to look at that in terms of it's all about strengthening systems, but our systems. And then the second thing is systems of health, which is different from health systems. So what do I mean by that? If you, if you look at the, the global health security agenda, the most prominent part of that is the JEs, the mm -hmm. Joint External mm -hmm. Evaluations. So you, you take a list of 
eighty something parameters and we score a country there. Of course, I can make a point and submit that without going to Togo. I can f fill out their JEE checklist. Yeah. Okay, and show the I mean, without going there, I mean, I'm just well and but it doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. The coronavirus uh, 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 outbreak is a good example of what that is not, and that is why I've never been a big fan of whether the, you have the GEs. I mean, it was a unifier, but it doesn't solve a problem. Yeah. You measure the problem, and you could have measured that problem without it. So in December and January, the coronavirus, we started, we were all having a vacation and having a fun day. We had something, they were wrong, something. Something is, where is that? We right. We find out. Well, Wuhan is in China, and myself, I was not paying attention to that. I remember yeah. the first time that people, I was on leave, and somebody called me and said, oh, come, just give me a break here. But it moved to something then. But if the continent of Africa would have been hit in December and January of that virus, it would have been wiped out. Been because there was no testing. It would have been devastating. No test completely. Yeah. I returned on the 21st, and I look at that and I say, hmm, the first thing, in any infectious disease outbreak is the ability to test. So we rallied the continent very quickly. On the 5th of February, I'm calling South Africa, my best people on the continent. Can you, can I send people for training? You say, what do we mean by send people for training? We don't have anything ourselves. We are going to the lab the weekend to try to put some primers together and do that. So I turned to, to, to uh, 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 Christian Drossen in Berlin. I said, your friend virologist is here and I see that you are listed as part of the people who have some primers and reagents. It's so connected to a small company in Berlin. And the company happens to be the same company that produces reagents for, for China. And they said, the first reaction was, John, you don't have uh, corona in Africa. Our focus is uh, uh, in Asia. So just hold on for one second. There. And of course, fast forward, nice guy. We agreed that I'll put a training together on the 9th of February uh, in, in Senegal. And we designed it so that it should be on a Thursday, Friday, so because the reagents have not yet left Berlin. So we wanted to give time for the reagents to fly from Berlin to I mean, So the reagents are put on in DHL. We are, we are tracking the DHL. I mean, now it arrived in Paris. And in Air France, it's trying to arrive at Dakar. He arrives at Dakar, calls uh, Madusa, go to the airport and pick that. Participants are arriving. My heart is pumping. Like, okay, if they arrive and there are no reagents, what will happen? The New York Times is the Washington Post, Le Monde, they have all flown into, uh, uh, into Dakar waiting to, for the training to happen. Finally, the reagents arrive and we do the training with 16 countries. The next week, we are in South Africa, we did a similar training and we ramped it up to 42 countries within uh, three weeks there. Now, the, the labs, the, the individuals that are being tested are all with the exception of, uh, uh, I believe, um, South Africa. People that we train in Senegal and in South Africa rapidly there. So the point I'm making is that my whole definition of security is the new world order is we should be able to synthesize and produce basic diagnostics for the continent. As we speak, none, zero company in Africa produce diagnostics mm. locally, none. We've used rapid tests for HIV for the last close to 40 years and fed markets in Asia and the United States and Europe and none in, in Africa. That has to change in the new... And so can I ask you, why has that not happened for well, HIV after all these years? After all these years, I, I, don't, I don't really know. I mean, I think that's where it's... it's uh, you can't blame it on it. I mean, we, that's the thing, Africa CDC, we are, we are promoting what you call the African Collaborative to Advanced Diagnostics, which we are saying, look, Diagnostics is, it offers a 1.2 billion market for the continent, so uh, consider diagnostics and consider it in a multiplex fashion to adapt it to the reality of, of the continent there. Yeah. So those are all health security issues that yeah. I mean you need to look at that. Uh, 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 vaccines will be produced, but if we do not uh, raise our voice on the continent, they probably first of all be distributed uh, 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 elsewhere, then uh, Africa gets its own share. So I think the point I'm making is Africa has to, CDC offers that unique opportunity to bring the issues that are really unique for the continent to the level of the head of states and let them, I mean, uh, uh, use their power to begin to change certain things. There. But it cannot be this pigeonhole approach where somebody tells you that now you have to talk about uh, sustainable development goals, uh, and then you say, oh, it's sustainable development goals, and whatever. Like. I don't mean to laugh, because of course, <laughs> it's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> just, but yeah. it is what we've done <laughs> yes, for just, the last 50, 60 yes. years, or maybe longer, but yeah. certainly in the last 50, 60 years, is 
whatever is the flavor of the month, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be, I don't want to be disrespectful, mm -hmm. uh, but whatever is the flavor of the month in global health, we just, we expect our African partners to just join up and join along. And it has been, uh, to me, um, really almost revolutionary to see the rise of an Africa CDC that says, we want to be setting our own agenda. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different model. One of the things I've been really intrigued by, and you brought this up, is most of these agencies and efforts sit within ministries of health. And of course, WHO is a membership of ministers of health and health. Um, but you, what you describe as the Africa CDC is really a project of the African Union and from the, of the head of states. Mm -hmm. Do you mind just talking a little bit more about what, why that difference is important, mm -hmm. what it means for the convening power and the agenda setting power of the Africa CDC, that in some ways you sit within, not within ministries of health per se, but within the broader yeah. political leadership. So the, 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 the Africa CDC sits within the, the, uh, the, the African Union Commission, which is like the European CDC. So, yeah. I mean, at that level, uh, you report to, uh, the, 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 you can report directly to the head of states. Um, in country, of course, that is where it really matters. Yep. I mean, you have what we are promoting is that each country should have its own national public health institute, a mini CDC, yep. which is uh, really supposed to be a, a factor arm mm -hmm. for your uh, uh, intervention. So that if there's a crisis like it is uh, now in many countries, or uh, call it crisis or a, a requirement to to respond, you have your epidemiologist lab, the EOC, and every surveillance all together and they can, you can deploy them uh, uh, adequately. I think that's um, uh, uh, important. It's still going to, we're still going to work closely with the Ministry sure. of Health. Of course. But we're seeing the setting of the agenda at the yeah. continent uh, is at a much higher level. You can actually convince them. For example, I'll say there are this, uh, the Africa Agenda for Health, which spans from 2016 to 2030. But if I ask many people in global health, nobody has probably heard about that. Yeah. But uh, if I ask a classroom full of global health experts if they've heard about universal health coverage or uh, sustainable development, everybody, or everybody has. That has done that. Yeah. But shouldn't those who are interested in the, the future and health of Africa be looking at where the agenda that they have set? I, mean, I think that's something that we need to promote. And at times it's not just because of the externalities, but because internally we do not do a good job at aggressively putting our own agenda and, on the table and discussing it there. Yeah. Um, how are you working on um, building expertise capacity within countries? So yes. it's a it's a brilliant model to have an Africa a Pan Africa CDC National Institutes of Public Health mm -hmm. within each country. Um, there are issues of you know how, making sure that they have sustainable funding, etc. But I want to talk about expertise because expertise is hard. Yes, uh, you can't grow it overnight. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be indigenously, yes. indigenously grown and yes. sustained. Yes. How are you thinking about that? How are you promoting that? So we've developed a framework for workforce development for Africa, public health workforce development in yeah. Africa in, in five flavors. Uh, one is traditionally, we said, we have to use the schools of public health more and support a network of schools of public health in Africa, yeah. incentivize them and make sure they spread for the young people to use their own schools of public health yeah. that are around the continent. Yeah. To weaponize that model, we've actually offered a scholarship ourselves, Africa CDC, to 10 students who are at the Vitz University studying public health. And I do visit them. It's an 18 uh, 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 months program. They will be completing soon as a pilot. I've since signed a convention with um, uh, an agreement with a, a school of public health in Morocco, mm. where the French part of, uh, of Africa, West Africa would do that. It's yeah. a pilot to show that concept there. I mean, when we started off, um, the, the tendency was what I call the 1950s, 60 model, where people come in and said, we want to work with you. I mean, we support you, it build your capacity, but if you just send 10 students to country X, I mean, I don't have any level, it could be, I mean, mostly it was like our Chinese friends would say, well, come to Sh Shanghai, Beijing, which design courses are you all in Europe. I'm a, and I told them that if you keep doing that, then you, uh, you're, you're making this, the young generation owe allegiance to you. Yes. 
I want them to owe allegiance to their own institution and be proud of their institutions yeah. in Africa. Yeah. So we, I said, if we have the money, so this is the math. The 10 students will cost me $400,000 to keep them for close to two years in South Africa. But with $400,000, I cannot send 10 students to the United States right. for an MPH program. So they have that. So we have those models there. So first of all, it's an MPH program. And the European uh, Developing Partner Trials Platform is working with us on that as well to scale that they like it. Second is the whole FETP program, the Field Epidemiology Training Program. If we go by the maths, that says we need one field epidemiologist to 200,000 people, and we are a population of 1.2 billion people, then we need 6,000. Wow. If you do simple yeah, math yeah. there. But we currently have 1,400 1, epidemiologists on the continent. That's a gap there of 4,000 uh, people that we yeah. can, just epidemiologists. Then we have laboratory leadership programs that we, are, we want to promote health information systems that, okay, that we need to promote them. Then besides that, we have short-term programs that we are designing, like a, a public health fellowship program for young people who graduate, and we can pull them together, put them into the National Public Health Institutes for one year or two years. And lastly, we just started a program called the Coffee Annan Scholar Program, mm. where named after Coffee Annan to uh, want it to be the same like the Fulbright program. And in recognition of Kofi Annan's um, uh, contribution in, in the Global Fund in, uh, for HIV, AIDS, and, and TB, which I think, uh, uh, like PrEPFA, became a turning point in our ability to respond and beat back HIV, AIDS in, in the 2002, 2003 time frame. There. Yeah. So those are different flavors we are doing in looking at um, workforce development on, on the continent. So I think um, it's a, a big challenge. Now, the second part of this is we have to think of that and think of how the career structure yeah. for, for the workforce we are developing. Right. Yeah. Without the appropriate career structure, we, we are, it's not just about training. It's also about, I mean, who they have. And that's where the National Public Health Institute, the idea is so attractive, where you can structure it in a way that somebody uh, like me who spent 24 years at the USCDC saw a pathway. Yeah. To, to grow. If you do your bench work well and whatever, you can become a section chief, you become a branch chief, you become a division director, and who knows, become the main. But if that structure doesn't exist in the country and you just, they trade you, you throw you in the ministry, I've heard in the Department of Disease Control, um, and somebody is made, a, 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 is, so that, those kind of pathways need to be developed yeah. on the continent. And lastly, about sustainability for funding is, we have to look outside of government. Mm. And, and look at the private sector and say, look, you have a stake in this. Whether it's the rise in non-communicable diseases or re-emerging and emerging infectious diseases or outbreaks like this will challenge your businesses. So uh, find some change in your businesses, put it somewhere in a, a, a pigeonhole and slowly over time, I'm calling it change for change. Well, I mean, with time, the change leads to something, and when the now break occur, we are not looking at uh, what is the Gates Foundation going to give us two million, or, or I mean, the Gates have been extremely supportive yeah, foundation yeah. about our right. effort, but we need to begin to own that kind of those kind of approaches yeah. to sustain the Africa CDC's work, the vision of Africa CDC. Imagine that if I, as a CDC Africa CDC director, I go to South Sudan, and I meet with the, the Minister of Health, and I said. We're going to support you uh, build your National Public Health Institute. And it doesn't be, need to be as massive as the US CDC. It could just be a two story yeah. building where the laboratory is in one corner, and then you have some your epidemiologists with their laptops and whatever in one corner there, and you have a good room, and you put a few computers there as an EOC. But the functionality is what is important. Then I go to the foundation, the Africa CDC Foundation, that we've done the change for change, and I extract two million. And I tell the government of South Sudan, say, we're not going to give you the two million. We're going to show me the building, we renovate it, equip it, and then you run it. The foundation will do it for you. It changes yeah. the dynamics of, of Because the, it becomes a partnership. It becomes a partnership. And, and the partnership is there. And you don't worry about, oh, would I, if I give my two million to the government, would they effectively use it? You are giving it to an African foundation. They are contracting from, from South Sudan. They are using, but they are contracting where? Yeah. They used to they make sure that, I mean, because we have to also be honest that uh, a large proportion of uh, money for advocated to health in Africa is not efficiently used. If we start just recuperating that and making sure that efficiency is in that, then you have enough money or you have 
a reasonable size of money to apply to your programs. Yeah. And I love this idea of building the career ladder because what happens when you don't have that career ladder, as you said, is the best and brightest decide they don't want to be part of this and yes. they will leave. Yes. And so that career ladder is fundamental to keeping the intellectual talent of Africa here at home uh, engaged. I'm going to ask you one last question, and this is a little bit of a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little self-serving, but I will ask it, which is, so how can American universities play a helpful partnership role in what you are trying to do? Because I agree with you that the old model of we come and say, hey, send us your 10 best students to Harvard and we'll train them. Because of course that creates a lot of complexity, like half of them don't go back. For them that may be a good thing, but in the long run it's not a sustainable model. Um, what's the right partnership? What is a, a better way for us sitting at a place like Harvard to say, love this model, love this uh, ownership, this agenda setting that really does need to come, to, come from Africa. And I want to support it. I want to be yeah. helpful. Yeah. And, um, and I want to be helpful in a respectful way that, that acknowledges where the agenda is. Do you have thoughts about what American universities can yes. do? Yes. In some thoughts, not all. And I would also, um, the, the one thing I've been, since you use the word self serving, I'm at, visiting Harvard, I must, must say, it. Harvard is a respected, highly valued uh, 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 educational asset in the whole world. I think, if, um, uh, I think that, I mean, you, you, you might be in and, and at times be um, uh, 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 blinded by that value that you bring, the, the trust mm. that people have. So why do I start with that? I'm saying that there are three things that Harvard can help support us. One is to champion the vision of what Africa CDC plans to do, the vision of the head of states and the wisdom of the head of states of Africa and what Africa CDC's mandate is and wants to do. And so that helps in that whole uh, component of um, systems of health, where the, the vision and the aspiration and instruments that the continent stands for is more understood. And if it's coming from the, the, the Harvard trumpet, it makes it vibrates, okay, and it connects with people. You say, well, the Harvard is saying this means it must yeah. be something there. I think that is very, very important. Has no, uh, it's not about money, but it's about championing a cause, which I think uh, if... Um, and a vision. And a vision. I think that yeah. is just, uh, I mean, such that the, the conversations in Washington, Paris, Geneva do not start with... Uh, they start with that, and the two views are not antagonistic. No. Like, we're saying that... Uh, that uh, we all agree on universal health coverage. It doesn't mean you cannot see that Africa has a health strategy. It only means that we have to find a way to make sure the two are complementary and not opposing to one another. So that is advocate, yep. advocating for I me. Mean, the second thing is about the, the, the partnership with our public health, um, schools of public health. Uh, not to fund them or anything, but to look at ways that as we build that network, Harvard's role there is to uh, say these are things that the lessons that you've learned uh, in public health that the network can can yeah. be busy there. I want the networks, uh, the schools of public health in Africa, to begin to have an entrepreneurial spirit, which means you create your own. Uh, 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 so you do three things at the university: you research, teaching, and and program implementation. There's absolutely no reason why there's uh, say. Uh, we need to scale up a, a program on treatment in Africa. We have to count, think of where well, it has to be. ICAP from Colombia making up. I mean, yeah, yeah, John yeah. Hopkins up to yeah. There's no reason why this university cannot do it. Uh, have a, a, a section that they think clearly and say, well, we have to have this. We'll partner with uh, ICAP, but I will partner with uh, Harvard. Uh, has programs over, overseas. They will do this, those partnership, uh, partnerships there so that in future we know how to do it like the way they do it. Is, is, you see what I mean? Yeah. So, and then that fits into the training program. The, as we advance our training models, we need quality embedded in it. Mm -hmm. And who else has the best quality here? I mean, schools like Harvard and others in the United States, you, you, you've done it all. You know how to, uh, what well, we've done some like. things, but, <laughs> we could, so, but we could engage more yeah, on those. So that, those would be the different areas that, um, I mean, I see the Harvard partner. And lastly, research, uh, uh, public health research, I mm. mean, and implementation science is key. One of the five pillars that Africa CDC has out uh, um, is um, uh, uh, supporting NPH, uh, uh, National Public Health Institute, and 
public health research. Mm. The whole concept of clinical research in Africa is, is, is within the public health system is lacking. And I think that vision, which is led from the top, from the heads of state, with capacity, with, with uh, intellectual development, laboratories across the continent, an agenda setting that is really African-led, um, I have a much better understanding of, and I started this just before we got talking, I, I mentioned that uh, my friend and colleague Peter Piot, mm -hmm. when I once asked him what gave him hope mm -hmm. on global public health over the next decades, he said, my number one thing is the Africa CDC. Mm -hmm. And I think you have articulated very nicely why Peter feels that way. So, John, I just want to say thank you for taking time to speak with me. Um, this was incredibly helpful, and I think for people who get the uh, privilege of watching you articulate your vision, um, I think they will better understand why Africa CDC really is the future of public health in Africa. Thank you for your opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah, and look pleasure. forward to a strong partnership with uh, the Institute. Yeah. I love that. Thank you.